Hey, everybody. I want to welcome you to The Real World Seen and Unseen. I'm Tony Hammock with Matthew Noyce, Cheryl Frey, Steve Chisholm, and Philip Hand. We're ministers of the gospel, and uh, we love Jesus, uh, various fivefold callings and anointings on our lives. Uh, you know, we're, we're just regular people who love the Lord. And uh, God is uh, doing things in the earth, and we're excited about uh, the Lord, the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that's here already. And the show is about trying to kind of understand how things work and how uh, t we can operate in the kingdom of God now and how we can be effective and productive in our relationship with God to bring Jesus the most glory. So if that's what you're interested in, you've come to the right place. Uh, we're, we're all about Jesus here. Um, I think we've all uh, surrendered our hearts and lives to Christ. We're all eager to uh, hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant at the, at the Bema Seat Judgment. Uh, we're trying to do the best we can with what we have, and we're trying to uh, help other people in their journey uh, with the Lord as well. I want to start in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26. Excuse me, I got the wrong banner. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is uh, verse uh, 26. Uh, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals. And the, my translation uh, translates the earth as all the wild animals, but then my translation has a subheading, and it says that the probable reading of the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, is the earth. So I believe that's the proper uh, scripture, that God has given dominion of the earth to man. Now, this is something that uh, is pretty well debated amongst uh, theologians. It'll probably continue to be debated amongst theologians for, for a long time. But I have decided for myself where I theologically believe uh, things seem to be, uh, and it has to do with um, the dominion of man. And, and the reason I say that is because I look at the earth and I look at the realm of the earth and I look at all the horrible things that happen on the earth. You know how people mistreat people. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of uh, a lot of news coverage on wars in Ukraine and there's there's wars in Yemen. There's wars in Ethiopia. There's wars in all over the world right now. And people are being killed. I mean, there's all kinds of abuse. There's all kinds of things that go on. And I've always believed and I still believe that God is good. And so because I believe God is good. Um, if God has the power or can just stop people from being mean to each other, why doesn't he? Why doesn't he just do that? So anyway, I've come to believe that God has turned over a certain percentage of the affairs of the earth to mankind and that the enemy quickly swept in in the garden to corrupt that position so the enemy could infiltrate man and cause tremendous problems for man. And that's the fall of man, and that's why the earth is so messed up and the earth is broken. But I, I wanted to bring up this idea, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get quiet here, uh, I think, if I can find my scripture. Here it is. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 referred to Adam as a living being, and he referred to Jesus Christ as the second Adam, and he called him a life-giving spirit. And the reason I find that significant is because I believe under the first Adam, we have this, we've, we've inherited this fallen nature, you know, this broken nature. But under the second Adam, we've received a, a life-giving spirit. You know, we have a new nature. Second uh, Corinthians, I think it's 517, says that our old nature has passed away. Behold, all things become new. You're a new creature. There's a metamorphosis that happens, and you become a new person in Christ Jesus. So anyway, I wanted to uh, kind of throw these ideas out here to you all and let you guys kind of kick kick back some thoughts on it. When I just want to quickly, too, let our listeners know and our viewers know Cheryl is in the middle of a flood at her house in Tulsa, and she's trying to get on the show with her cell phone and because her internet's down. And uh, anyway, she may or may not be able to rejoin us, but she's obviously a, a precious person and a great, a great contributor to this program. But anyway, 
the idea of God giving dominion of the earth to man. Let me give you one more scripture, and then I'll, I'm going to hush it, hush it up and let you all have it. Psalm 115, 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to somebody. Who's, who's got something they want to contribute on this? Steve, go ahead. Hey. Matthew. Yeah, so you saw that. Uh, you saw me unmute there. Huh? I did. I'm, I'm trying to pay attention. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, all right. Um, yeah, this is, this is good stuff. I love looking at original intent. Um, I believe that there's a, a scheme by the enemy down through the ages to dilute man's relationship with God to the point that we, we misunderstand. We don't understand who we're created to be. Um, you know, the Bible calls Jesus the firstborn of many brethren. Don't, the brethren he's talking about is us. Uh, God, we're his, we're God's children. And he created us to be that. And, and uh, like your, the scripture that you read there, God has given the earth from the very beginning to man to control. There's a thing about God that we got to understand to get to begin all this. And, and it refers to it in several places in scripture. But one is Psalm 138, two. It says you have exalted your word above your name. Now, in the Hebrew language, the the name of a thing or a person is the person or thing. Um, it, it's it's much more meaningful than it is in in our cultures. Um, uh, the a name of a thing, you know, there's a saying, what's in a name? Well, um, when they named, uh, and there's so many examples through the scripture, the name is so significant. It represents in full the person. And uh, what it basically is saying in Psalm 138, uh, verse two there, is that God has brought his, himself under his word. In other words, when he speaks its law and he will not violate his law, his own word, he makes himself subservient to his word, his own word. When he says a thing, he doesn't go back on it. And that's what makes him God. That's what makes him just. He is truth. He, he's just not truthful. He is truth. When he speaks, truth comes out. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the word of God. We understand that from the scripture, from the beginning. Uh, we see in creation, when God spoke, the sun came out. There's the manifestation of the three parts of the Godhead was the Father spoke, the Son, and the Spirit of God incubated, it says, hovered over the waters, received that word, and revealed it. And still today, Jesus that's what Holy Spirit does. He said, I go to the Father and I send another comforter and he will testify of me. He will reveal me to you. He will take of mine and reveal unto you. So Holy, we see the, the, the three parts of the Godhead, the creator of the universe, God the Father, who when he spoke forth creation, the Son came out, the Word. He sent his Word and healed them. We see all down through the scriptures. Um, Jesus, and God can't lie because... Uh, Jesus is truth. I mean, he's that's his name uh, in the scripture in Revelation. Be, I beheld a white horse, and, and he that sat on him is faithful and true. Uh, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth through, came. Uh, the law uh, was given by Moses, but grace and truth came in Jesus. Uh, so that's why God can't lie, not just because he has integrity, in our understanding of, of that, but because it's, it's just impossible. Truth just exudes from God. I mean, when you, when your words have the power to make the thing, what you said it is, how can you lie? I mean, if he says up is down and down is up, it is. If he says, you know, red is blue and blue is red. It is there. I mean, he's, his words are the very essence of creation. So God is true. And he 
has made himself subservient to his own word. In other words, he won't violate his word. In, in the beginning of the scripture that you referenced, he said, let's get man in our image and let's give him dominion. He did. He gave man dominion over the earth. Uh, he made, made man lord of the earth. Okay, and that's very significant. So whatever Adam established in the earth, that's what it was. Now, God's intention, the garden, which, which is a garden of Eden, literally means garden. The word garden means the surrounding to surround is with a wall. And then Eden means pleasure or presence for the moment. So garden of Eden literally means the surrounding presence or pleasure of God. So that's where heaven met earth is in that garden. And God put man and woman in that garden. And he said, now look, his, he had two different uh, uh, instructions, sets of instructions. One is for the garden. The, his inst the garden, if you go back and read that whole account, he told the man to keep it, which means to protect, to adorn it, which means to celebrate it. What's he talking about? Presence, the presence, to keep and protect the presence of God, hmm. that relationship. And he, that was God's mandate to mankind concerning the garden. But he said, I want you to do it, which means to bring it under. Bring it under what? Bring it under this garden culture that we have here. I want you to bring this garden to the rest of the earth, the earth, and I want you to multiply. I want you to fill up this earth with those like yourself that, that you will procreate. You will, uh, you will further my kingdom in the earth. I want you to establish my kingdom in the earth. Well, man signed on to another kingdom, which was based on gold and, and jewels and all these things that were the image of that fallen angel, Lucifer. Um, every pressure in, in, we can see that in, uh, in Ezekiel, uh, that, that talking to Lucifer, thou has been in the garden in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was your covering onyx and jewels, and sapphire and gold. And your pipes and tabrets were in you in the day that you were made You're talking about musical instruments and talent. And what do we see is the currency of the earth today because of what Adam did. What is the currency? What's value held as valuable in this earth? It's those things, gold and jewels and all those things that were part of the image, the very image of that fallen angel uh, and talent. Uh, it's a, a cult of personality. We see personalities that are worshipped and idolized. And that this cursed earth that man signed on because he was he had the authority to do it by him participating, partaking. He authorized that in the earth instead of spreading the presence of God. So every, but God had bound himself to his own word. As you said, God had put, it says in, in that uh, Psalm 115, that the heavens belong to God, but the earth uh, to the sons of man. That's because that's what God decreed. And so, it was going to take a, a man that was like God or, or that combination, God and man combination, because it, it took that authority. You have to have that to have authority in the earth. That's what my Adam was, the first Adam. And but when he when he authorized that, and I've said this before, it's like a biometric. Let's use, for example, a thumbprint access point. And I used to install some of these things you put your thumb on there and because of your identity you it opens a door okay he was authorized to do that because of who he was and how he was made but in doing it he lost the moment that that word he his the word of god concerning man was like god not god like god OK, but when he bought that other image, when he offered that image, 
he lost that because Holy Spirit doesn't reveal anything but the word of God. Doesn't reveal, reveal anything but the word of God. So Holy Spirit departs and it's now it's tarnished. He doesn't have the ability to open that door again. And there's no one qualified yet. <laughs> but then the word was made flesh. This, you said the second, second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus. He came. He was God. And was God. Jesus was God like man. And he was that perfect combination. He had to come in the form of a man to do everything right, to live right, to be perfect, to abide by the law. And he did to be authorized to undo what Adam did. Praise God. That's the gospel. Jesus came and to undo that fall. He came the second Adam, the last Adam actually came and set things straight again. He got things back on track. It's very important. I think we don't pay enough attention. I'll say this one last part, and then then I'm going to listen. But uh, I don't think it's we pay enough attention to that part of the work that Jesus did in the wilderness when he went to be tempted. Very important. That was He was undoing at that moment the very thing that Adam had done. He was, it says, he was in all points tempted like as we are. We could say it like this. He was in all points tempted. Does that does that apply to us on a daily basis? Sure, he was he was tempted in every way. Like he had, there's nothing that we haven't faced or that we'll face that he hasn't faced. But that scripture is referring to Adam. He was in all points tempted like as Adam, yet without sin. He undid that very last part of the ten, three parts of the temptation. See, Satan is not all knowing. He didn't know. Uh, just immediately who he was. He had to figure out who he was. He could read. He could see the prophecies. He knew how he was supposed to come, but he's gauging to find out who, the, is this him? Is this him? And so he put him through a test. And this last part, it was very important. The third test was he, he took him on the high uh, place, the mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he said, you see these? And Satan rightly said, these are mine. He rightly said that. What the scripture says, he is the God of this world, of the cosmos, which means facade, false front, the world system. And the reason he can rightly say that is because Adam authorized it. Adam signed off on it. He gave it over to him. But he said that. Uh, this is mine, and if you'll bow and worship me, you can have all this. The same test that Adam basically failed. But Jesus did what Adam was supposed to do at that moment. First words out of his mouth, away with you. <laughs> Adam could have done that. He had the authority. He was charged with protecting the presence of God. He was charged with subduing earth. He could have said, away with you. And Jesus said, away with you. You, written, shall look, right? serve, you shall serve the Lord thy God. Him, you shall worship the Lord thy God. Him only shall you serve. I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, I was just saying, you know, where Jesus responded with the word of God yes. to the temptations and then ultimately yeah. away with you. Hey, yeah. uh, Steve, I want to bring Matthew in here on this discussion. Uh, Absolutely. You know, in regards to dominion, you know, and, and I think it matters because – and I just want to give a little segue. It seems to me that there are many, many Christian people that love to say this, God is in control. They love, they love it. They love to say that and they love to feel it. And I, I love the idea, but when I look at the world and I look at what happens and I look at things going on around me, Matthew's just gone through a horrible tragedy you know, there's things going on in the lives of people around us. And we think, man, you know, and, and when people say God's in control, they say it like God is micromanaging the decisions of mankind in the moment. Like every single solitary thing that happens, everything, God's doing it. 
And so I want to I want to turn it over to Matthew uh, to let him kind of speak into the idea that God gave dominion of the earth to man and what that means. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Let me begin with a little story. So I went to the beach. We have some beautiful beaches here. Uh, that's a cheap plug. Come visit Antigua and Barbuda. <laughs> So we got, so I went to the beach today and I saw a gentleman there swimming. So I saw him swimming day after day. And one day I just felt, I just walked up to him. We started talking, just very trivial. That's how, you know, and I, I, I looked at, I look at him <laughs> and I said to him, God doesn't have his way here on earth. And his eyes bulge open. And I said, I don't know what you believe, but God doesn't have his way here on earth. And the guy, just, the guy just freezes like a statue. And I explain to him um, what I mean by that statement. And he says, my whole life, I've been asking that question. And no one could answer that for me. What you just said makes so much sense to me. I believe a lot of people grapple. And one of the age-old questions and one of the things that people say that are... Uh, you know, people who doubt God, they say, well, if there's a God, why is there so much suffering on the earth? If your God is so good, why does so much bad take place here on earth? And then I would answer them and I would say to them, well, God doesn't get his way here on earth, right? Um, it's interesting as Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in that prayer, in that model of prayer, he says to them, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it suggests to us that God's will, he wants to have his will in heaven down here on earth. But somehow we have to be the conduit to pray this will into existence. Like I don't believe that if God's will for little children to be molested. Like every morning I wake up and I read the paper and I'll be very honest, sometimes I stop. There's, there's a section in the paper that says world events and I just stop and I'll be honest. I just, I, it, I, I wake up and I look at it and it's this morning, if I pull up this morning's paper, 20 dead and it's just my region and not even the globe, like 20 dead in explosion, um, baby found chopped up and mangled in the back of a car, stepfather and you read and, and i don't know but for me sometimes like overload it just like it, it, it jerks me and it really hits me sometimes that i have to just stop reading and the concept that this is what god desires that god wants all this suffering to take place the, the thing is god has as you rightly said handed the earth over to satan um, to, forgive me, Adam, Adam forfeited that right over to Satan. I'm not going to sit here like, like I, I, I know everything, but I know that God wants us to pray and to pray fervently for his will to be done here on earth. It seemed like if one pastor said, God, and he says, God can't do anything if we don't pray. We need to pray God's will into existence. So, um, very, very simple, but very profound. It, it helps to answer the age-old question, you know, even like sometimes why does good thing, bad things happen to good people? Why is, if God is so loving, why is there so much evil that takes place? And my simple answer, God doesn't have his way here on earth. And we could, we could segue a bit, but I'll, you know, there's some Traits, um, schools of thought, you know, the omni omniscience of God and, you know, God has his way. But the Bible says, you know, God's not willing that any should perish, yet many perish because God does not have his way here on earth. And I could get in some trouble in here this morning with that, but let me be here myself. But God doesn't pick and choose, you know, I see Philip laughing, uh, you know, but God doesn't pick and choose. He's given us a will. And there are consequences to our actions. So I'll, I'll, I'll just segue there after, after Philip. It is, 
it, it is an age old question, isn't it? The the role of man and the role of God and where are these lines? And the reason I wanted to bring up this discussion is because in my personal opinion, I, I live in the world of human responsibility. So like like I, I pray as if my prayers are changing things. I believe as if my activity is doing something. And I've got a I've got a young preacher friend that calls people hard shelled Calvinists. He says, you know, like there are these hard shelled Calvinists that are like, no, no, you're wrong about all that. But I want to turn it over to Philip and let him speak into this subject. Thank you for being with us, Philip. I appreciate you. It's always an honor to join with these uh, guys and uh you know, you, you, you got to really uh, feel their heart in this conversation. So thanks for inviting me. One of, one of the things I realized is that, you know, I'm a prophetic guy. Um, some would say pathetic, but I, I like to say prophetic, uh, and which means that I, I like to look at the scriptures from not just the physical uh, truth of of what they represent. I believe in a seven day create or six day creation. I believe in those things. Um, you know, a lot of people would disagree with me on that. Uh, but I'm a literal guy, but I'm also prophetic. And so when I read these account in Genesis, it begins with the spirit of God hovering over the waters and, uh, the, the waters without form and they were void. And then, you said something interesting just a moment ago um, that was uh, interesting and, uh, you know, about our prayers ha ha making a difference. And uh, James 5, I believe it is, it's the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And the connection there in James 5 is to do with uh, sin, sin in people's lives and, and overcoming sin. And, of course, Jesus Christ has, has paid for our sin, but we have a responsibility to deal with our sin as well we have a responsibility to to rule over our sinful lives our flesh uh if you like and so when i look at the creation story the creation fact um this thing that we live uh, on called earth i also think of the spiritual uh, garden of eden and the spiritual garden of eden for me of course is the place where the holy spirit dwells and that is in the born again believers so first of all if you're not a christian then uh, you've, you've got a problem because the holy spirit is hovering nearby but you are void and without form uh, you're dead and you need the holy spirit to come and do a work of cre recreation inside you if you like or uh, restoration whatever you want to call that jesus called it being born again uh, he said you must be born again so I believe recreation or creation on the spirit is also like uh, the story in Genesis where God said to Adam and Eve, have dominion over this creation. I believe we have to choose dominion over our creation, the inner spirit. Uh, so uh, really, it's for me, it's, it's, it's that. It's having the Garden of Eden on the inside of you, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water in other words refreshing words uh, words that have power in prayer uh, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much and these words have power and we need to speak to our creation whether it be the natural creation around us or whether it be the supernatural creation within we need to speak to ourselves uh you know the, paul taught to the corinthian churches about uh edifying yourself through speaking in tongues and in other words letting the spirit rule over your flesh and your mind and your thinking get your stinking thinking out of the way as they say and get aligned with god's spirit and i believe it's we have a responsibility to take care of the inner man and once we take care of the inner man, we'll start to be able to make a difference with the outer man, with the, the world around us. But I believe most of us, if we're honest, uh, will say we struggle from time to time, or if not all the time, with our flesh, with the things of our thinking, with the things of the world that have been thrown at us, with the temptations that have come our way. And Jesus is always our example because he, he lived in this world and he lived by the Spirit. And he, 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 first of all, he fellowshiped with the Father continuously. That is one of the keys to overcoming. 
Uh, if you want to overcome this world, if you want to overcome the flesh, you have to get into the presence of, with the Father God. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, how do we connect with God? And, and Jesus said, if, you, if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you've connected with me, you've connected with God. So we must come to Jesus recognizing that he represents the Father on earth. And so we come to Jesus Christ as our Lord, our Savior, and our God. We then, we then, uh, we submit to his will. The disciples said, that, then how do we pray? And, and he said, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we come and we put God in the rightful place. Uh, like yourselves, I don't believe God is in control. Uh, I believe he has a plan and he will see that plan through. And at the ultimate that plan will unfold as he desires. But in the details in between, we have free will of how to live our lives. We have free will to come to Christ. We have free will to re uh, reject Christ. And we have free will once we've come to Christ to continue with Christ. Um, and that's the truth of it. And if we're not going to continue with Jesus, we're in trouble. Uh, so there's some keys to walking with God. And it has to, first of all, recognize who God is, recognize the rightful place God has, and realize that we can speak to our enemy. Jesus rebuked the devil. Uh, and we need to be doing the same. So when those voices come in and we think our thoughts are leading us astray, our thoughts are, are, are convincing us we were born a different way to how God made us, when we, we have those kind of thoughts, we need to rebuke them. We need to say, that is not me. That's not my identity. My identity is in Christ Jesus because I'm a new creation in him. And he's created all things new. And so uh, once we realize that the creation that we're going to struggle with, first of all, might be the world. But once we get over the fact that the world is the world, we start to deal with the inner creation. And then once we get that sorted, we'll be able to overcome the world. So thank you. Mm. Amen. I, can I interject something there? Sure. That that's fantastic, man. Good word, uh, Philip. Um, right on the money. Uh, that garden now is in the hearts of each believer. It's been reestablished. You know, out of the in the garden in in Genesis, it talks about the river that flowed out of the midst of the garden, and it watered all the areas around. Well, that river, it's out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's where that presence of God resides. That's where we are that portal through which heaven meets earth. And you're exactly right. In the first, in that, in that uh, template prayer that Jesus gave his disciples, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This, this earth fir first, just like Philip said. This is where we establish lordship first, and then we spread it throughout our realm of, of influence. And it's heart to heart, soul to soul, man to man is the way the kingdom progresses. That's, you know, that, that it's we're taking, we're retaking territory. Um, and that's why the scripture, when Jesus talked to Peter, he said, uh, he said, uh, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church is the is the the moving force that's reinvading, that's taking territory that was intended to be God's territory, and that territory is hearts and souls of men and women. It, it's, it's spread from heart to heart, just as Philip said. This is where this is my earth lordship, and then from there on, I influence every place I set my foot, every person I come into contact with and spread that lordship. You know, there's a, in Romans 8, it talks about this, really. Uh, it says from the time of creation, all, uh, from the beginning, all creation is in birth pains, yearning, desiring after the, met, the manifestation, the revelation of the sons of God. Why? Because it was never fulfilled in the beginning when it started with Adam. It wasn't fulfilled. We are the fulfillment of that. And it comes out of groanings that can't be uttered. The spirit, man, it comes from us, out of our hearts. Out of our hearts. 
where heaven is, where heaven resides, we're we're uh, revealing God. We're revealing the the will of God in the earth out of out of ourselves. And I come through this building of prayer and spending time. It is prophetic. It's all the manifestations of the Spirit. It's it's that's it's every word that the Lord has to say. It comes through His servants. It comes through His people, uh, through His children, and so. It's very important uh, to understand that. That's what Jesus established. And let me say one more thing. And we can see this. And I, I urge you to go and look at this. It's, uh, Matthew 3 and look at up just a little bit. Matthew 3 and look it up just now. But uh, where John first talks about um, the kingdom is at hand or the kingdom is coming is what is the words that John used. Uh, and and he talks about those that came out. He says, generation of vipers, who has warned you to escape the coming wrath? He said, behold, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. It's very interesting. What trees are he talking about? Well, he's talking about wicked people, but it's more than that. He's talking about that the 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 enemy's kingdom has been established in the hearts of other men, of men in the earth. And that, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which represented uh, Satan's image, is established there. But because of this new, this kingdom that is coming, uh, I think it's Matthew 3, this kingdom that is coming, he said, the axe, behold, even now, the axe is laid at the root. We're about to eradicate that that uh, worldly curse earth kingdom out of the hearts of men. That's what he was talking about. And then Jesus later on, uh, I think the next chapter says the kingdom of God is here now at hand. It was there at, with his arrival. He said the time is now, the kingdom is now. And they asked him later, where is this kingdom? He says within you. Uh, it's the father's good pleasure to give unto you the kingdom. And it's absolutely right. Uh, um, great word, Philip. It's it's our hearts, and we're spreading this. We are the moving onslaught that is retaking ground for the kingdom of God, and it's hearts, the hearts and souls of men. And that's how the kingdom's perpetuated. It doesn't come with physical observation. It comes through our hearts and through our mind. It's out of our bellies flow rivers of living water out of that presence of God that resides within us. So uh, praise the Lord. It's exciting Amen. stuff the day we live in and the mandate that we have. I want to put out an idea too, uh, as it relates to God being in control. And then I want Matthew to share some things, but you know, sometimes I I've heard people say, maybe not that God's in control of every single solitary thing that happens, but that God's in charge. And if you think about like working in a factory, you know, the boss is 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 the boss or the owner of the company and that owner can uh, make decisions and do things. But that the boss is not right there all the time controlling that behavior of every single employee in the factory. And sometimes I think that that's a, maybe somewhat of an oversimplification, but it's also a similar model to the way it seems like things are that God is not in control of every single solitary thing that happens. He has delegated that control to humanity. Satan's come in and corrupted. He's restored it through Jesus Christ, like Philip beautifully described a second ago. Uh, and so anyway, I wanted to put that idea out there. And also I wanted to bring in a comment. You guys on the bottom of the screen, you might have to sit up a little taller. I think this comment might cover you up. Uh, Crescinda says, my thought, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, my thoughts. Earth is temporary. We have limited time to do as much as we can in this fallen world. It is our responsibility to pray and do his will. His will is that everyone should be saved and know Jesus as their personal savior. I believe that we will see how powerful, almighty, and how loving he is when we get our promotion one day. Amen. I, I agree with that. I, I also believe that we leave a lot on the table uh, in this life, the, the table I believe has been set. I believe that the fullness of the kingdom of God is available to every believer. 
I believe whosoever will, uh, you've been given everything you need for life and godliness through your knowledge of him who's called you by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in what? The divine nature that the, the life of God flowing through us and to release his kingdom now on the earth. So, uh, Matthew, hopefully I, I didn't talk too much and mess up your flow. Not at all, bro. Not at all. I have a little verse I'd like to read um, from Matthew, the brother with the nice name, the brother with the best name in the Bible, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Um, Jesus speaking, red letters. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gather her chicks, her chickens under her wings, and you would not. This verse, it speaks to Jesus' desire, God's desire to do something. Um, this to me was, this scripture was actually born out one day when we had some rain here. I was living in an area called Villa. Nothing, we had some hard rain. And I looked outside and I saw this chicken. And the chicken was wet, 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 wet. And the rain was just beating the chicken. And the chicken was like three feet, three feet from my house. And I thought, you foolish chicken. Couldn't you have walked a few more feet? You could have gotten a shelter on the veranda. You could have gone under the house um, and gotten some shelter. So this rain just keeps pouring. This chicken is getting wetter and wetter, wet. And I'm thinking, you know, oh, foolish little chicken. So I, when the rain stopped, I peeped outside to look at this chicken. And I saw, I think as God will have it, the chicken just get up. And when she got up, they were all these little chicks that were on the knee of her. And they were all dry. And she was soaked to the, to the feather. She was a wet chicken. But all the chick, little chicks under her were dry. And I think, like, and that's when this verse made so much sense to me. Jesus says, hey, I want to be that covering for you. I, I, I want to gather you under my wings so that the, the many storms and trials of this life, the, 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 the chicken, she absorbed the full brunt of the weather. Meanwhile, they were warm and cuddled underneath. I do believe that some of the things that we occur, uh, that happen to us in this world, we, um, they happen to us because of us not submitting to God and it not necessarily being his will. Because Jesus said to them emphatically here, I wanted to gather you on the knee as a chicken gathers her hens but he says you would not it's so easy to pass the book it's so easy to say that well like even like um in antigua there's a little saying i don't know if people say it in the us or in the uk but every time somebody dies a little off topic but somebody dies and and people and the saying here that people say well, that's just the way it was meant to be. That's just the way um, uh, they had to die. Jump high or jump low. If, if God says that's the way you have to go, that's the way you have to go. And I have, you know, I, I, I have opposed that passionately in many, many ways. Because I said to them, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The Bible I have said to the person, so let's look at this. I put up a yellow caution tape and I say, don't cross here. You burst through the caution tape, speed right ahead, drive over the cliff and die. Is that God's will for you? You burst through the caution tape of God's word. So, for example, God says there ought to be no sex before marriage. And that's still a thing. And you burst through that caution tape of God's word. You go out there, you be, you be promiscuous, a whoremonger is the word the Bible uses. You pick up a, a STD and you die of AIDS. And then somebody says, well, Brother Matthew, that's just the way it goes. That's, what, that, that's the plan that God had for him. 
But it's not. It, it goes against scripture. It goes against when we burst through God's word. The Bible says that prayerlessness is sin. And that's such a challenge to me. Because I just believe that we, the Bible calls us co-laborers together with Christ. That, that simply means to me, we have a part, maybe a small part, but a part to play in what happens here on this earth. And far too often that's just relegated and I guess that's what God that that's what God wanted, and I, I simply don't believe that's true. I had a uh, conversation with another minister at a funeral. This may be a little inappropriate, but we were sitting there, and another guy was officiating the service. And I leaned over to my buddy, he's a minister, and I said, "Hey, do you think when it's your time to go, it's your time to go?" And he said, "No." <laughs> and I said, why? He said, because if it wasn't your time to go and you get eaten by a shark, you're still going to go. You're still, you're still going to go. You're still gone. You know, or if you jump off a building and hit the ground at 32 feet per second squared, you're still gone, even if it's not your time. But what do people say? Well, that was his time, of course, you know, because... But data, like, and, and I don't know what people think about data, but like when I was a, a high school kid, I had a friend who was a, a Christian friend. I wasn't a believer at the time, but he and I had both had driver's education class together. And he was driving his mom's car and I was sitting in the passenger seat and I, and I looked at him and I noticed he didn't have a seatbelt on. Well, we'd had this driver's ed class where they showed pictures of people who didn't wear a seatbelt and what happens to them to shock you, you know, to get you motivated to wear your seatbelt. And so I was concerned for his safety. And so I'm in the passenger seat and I said to him, I said, hey, Joe, put your seatbelt on, man. And he looked at me real serious and he said, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And without any hesitation, I said, so you're saying God prefers people who wear seatbelts over people who don't. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I mean, is that the, is that what I'm supposed to take away from this? And uh, so even as a, like a early on, you know, it didn't make sense to me. Now I believe there's an appointment. There's an appointment for men to die and then the judgment, right? I mean, that's in the Bible. But the idea that whenever it is that you die, that's your appointed time, is not necessarily the truth. I do believe people prematurely die before the time that they, they should. And, but see, like if you, if you believe that there's nothing you can do to alter your lifespan, then uh, exercise and nutrition goes out the window, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, why waste our time with all that? I mean, there are a lot of things that safety, you know, why wear a helmet on a motorcycle? That's stupid. You, you don't need that. Right. I mean, does that even make sense? No, not to me. It doesn't. Now, somebody else out there might think, well, you know, of course. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, it's, yeah, go swim with shark infested waters. You know, you know, hey, there's a shark way. Well, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. Go out there, man. Get in there with those sharks. I mean, right? I mean, does that even make sense? So, I don't know. I, I know people have ideas, and sometimes I think people's ideas are are just wrong. And and I, but I want people to like. I want people to realize, and and I and I want to bring in this uh, the back the the idea Crescinda put in here a minute ago, that this life, this life is short. And we only have so much time to receive everything we need to release what we need. But see, if we're if we're focused on God in the heavens doing all these things and we're sitting back and we're like, God, you know, you're in charge, you're in control, you're going to do your thing. I'm just going to sit here and wait, you know, or watch. We may leave a ton of potential uh, eternal glorious treasure and works for Jesus on the table. And man, we'll stand before Jesus and he's going to be like, what did you do? Why did you just sit there like that? I mean, I, I don't want to hear that. You know, now I'll tell you what I might hear. Let me, let's go to the other side of the theological coin. 
You know, God could just pat me on the head and say, you thought you were really doing stuff down there, didn't you, Tony? And I said, yeah. he say, you didn't. I did it all. Come on in, you know, enter into my rest. I was okay, <laughs> right? But, but if it's the other way and God's expecting us to obey, God's expecting us to do things and serve him, not, not for salvation. We're not, we're not working for our salvation, we're, but we are working. Jesus said to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So we are working for eternal treasure. And I like, I like to tell people this. I don't know what you guys will think about this, but our works will not save us. But our works may be used by God to save someone else. So, yeah, works aren't going to save me. But had I never heard the gospel, could I have been saved? You know, would I have been saved? Was an angel going to preach to me? Well, you know, so so I think there is definitely a, a role for the human being in all of this. And uh, anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna hush. Philip, tell tell me something. Well, you you just got my brain firing. If I'm honest, <laughs> it's uh, it's yeah. I mean, several verses have jumped into mind. You know, there is a opportunity to have our lives extended. That's biblical. Uh, you know, years have been added to people in the past, and I believe years can be added to us. Uh, I just uh, shared a conference in Oslo in Norway uh, about my resurrection experiences where God has uh, raised the dead, particularly me. And, you know, and I believe that, you know, God can overrule our actions, uh, but that's really rare. Um, I, I think God... Um, allows accidents to happen um, because, you know, we have free will and we have choice. Uh, if we want to, you know, eat uh, bad food constantly and not exercise, then we're going to uh, fall short of the glory of God. And I think the Bible says, you know, that uh, an honorable death is laying down your life for your friends. And uh, a dishonorable death is uh, not disciplining your children, not disciplining and directing the church, and instead sitting there watching the world go by. Um, and, you know, I look at Job. Job was looking at his uh, kids who are living for the world, living for their flesh. And uh, eventually the devil came and took advantage of that. And Job was a righteous man and he was praying for his kids, but his kids still... Uh, their lives were lost. And, you know, God restored what the devil had taken. And I think that's the key is God is in the business of restoration. And he's a part of salvation is protecting us. But you see, he's protecting us uh, for a future. Uh, he's, he's promised a resurrection for us in the future. Uh, he's promised um, a better life in the future. This life right now, we're going to have troubles, tribulations and trials and including death. And it's unpleasant. It's nasty and it's horrible. But we are supposed to be a light. And that means we've got to live like an example to the world. We've got to bring revelation of Jesus, the illumination of God's word. And we've got to uh, let Jesus be seen in us. And if we're doing anything contrary to that, we're going to miss the point of what God's called us to do. And um, I believe then we, we're in dangerous territory uh, when we, we, we think little of ourselves. Um, you know, one of the things that really irritates me is when um, Christians say, oh, it's all God. It's all God. Can I tell you? No, it's not. It's you too with God. God has chosen to use you. And if you're not going to get partnered with God, God will not use you. He will bypass you and he will let you live for self and die for self. And he will use somebody who's dying to self and living for him. That's the truth of it. Uh, so we have choices, you know, and that's the, you know, the, we've got to man up, if, it, if you like. We've got, to, we've got to turn around and say, my choices today are going to affect my kids' choices tomorrow. My choices today are going to affect my spiritual walk with Christ today. And um, we have to say, you know, I get tempted just like any man. You know, Jesus got tempted just like any man. We have to make a choice. Do we live for God and die to self, or do we live for the flesh? Um, so, you know, I, I believe we have choices in this world. And uh, Jesus said, I have overcome this world. And he also has promised that he is in us and we are in him. And so that's God and man together, not that man becomes God, 
but that we become uh, submitted to God's will in our own personal life. That's my thoughts. Do you think, do you think too, that perhaps if we take the mindset of everything that... <laughs> thank you, Chris, in the woman up. <laughs> and um, do you think, though, that it's very convenient and it's also... If we take the standpoint, if it is all God, it takes away all of the responsibility from us. So the person who doesn't want, I'm just thinking that's such a convenient, lazy person's mindset that, hey, it's all God, so I don't have to do anything. And I'm very, I'm, I'm concerned about the society that, the contemporary time that we find ourselves in now, where people are pretty lazy. You know, everything is about convenience. Um, nobody wants to suffer. I'm, and I'm not raising my hand. I actually hate suffering, but it's a part of this life. But nobody wants to be inconvenient. The services have to be scripted down to the second because I got to watch my, my program on television. That I can just see that that mindset spilling over. A lazy person will say amen when somebody says it's all about God, God, because then we don't, why pray? I have a challenge when people say, well, God's going to have, God has his way here. I'm like, so why do I pray? Why do I have to pray if God's going to have his will? In fact, why do I even evangelize? Why do I go out there and tell anybody about Jesus if every person who will get saved, has to get saved. It's beyond their control. So why do I go out there and share the gospel? Why do I pray? Why do I fast? I, I need to eat some more and turn over my plate less. I just, I'm just thinking of the mindset of an individual to which this, this idea would seem very, very exciting. It relegates the responsibility from man and just puts it all on the shoulders of God. Well, and I think that's what people actually do, you know, and that's why I'm talking about it, because I think there are some really good godly Christian people who have their th theology a little bit wonky, and they are missing many, many, many opportunities. And I want to propose to them, hey, come on, let's let's think about this for just a minute, because uh, I, I believe that God offers us an exchange of lives. You know, he, he takes our broken, sinful life and he says, I want you. That's the most beautiful thing on this earth. I want you. I love you. I want you. I want your broken life. I want your garbage. I want your sin. And I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. I'm going to make your life meaningful. I'm going to give you significance. I'm going to use you for, I'm going to put my spirit in you. So you're going to be a little Christ, a Christian. You're going to do the work I've been doing. This is my plan for you. But we got Christian people who are just like, no, God's going to, God's got it. <laughs> you know, God, God's going to take care of it. <laughs> You know, yeah, he's going to take care of it through people. <laughs> and, and that's my that's my point. God is using humanity in a huge, huge way. And I mean, I think you could probably get out of balance a little bit with these ideas and, and, and minimize the role that the, the cosmic God, you know, God in the heavens has over over the earth and all that kind of thing. But there is so much that God wants to do through people. And I think people it. Are they uncomfortable with that? I think, yeah, I think our psyche, you know, our minds, sometimes we're uncomfortable with having responsibilities. Sometimes we're uncomfortable with having to do things. Uh, but nevertheless, I believe the Holy Spirit empowers us for service. The Holy Spirit fills in those gaps for us if we'll embrace the, you know, what God wants to do in our lives. I believe everything will go, uh, go exceptionally well. Um, Steve's having technical problems. Uh, he's, uh, you know, when he was on the, the program, I noticed his audio was kind of breaking in and out. And his video was pretty uh, low resolution, which usually is my my server's uh, signal to say, hey, this guy's internet feed's not that great. And he's probably in a lot of rain. And the rain sometimes can mess up the lines. So uh, 
Steve's dropped out of the program, but uh, hopefully uh, he can get back into the program. But uh, anyway, guys, that's it, man. That's all I've really got. I wanted to uh, – I want to kick it over to Matthew. Matthew, you got a comment that you've put on here. I want to read that. Uh, Proverbs 11, 1, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. I was actually working in a, in a factory uh, weighing things when that scripture came to light uh, for me. Uh, I, I was trained uh, in a certain way that wasn't really uh, biblically correct. And the Lord hit me with that scripture. And I was like, uh oh, I got <laughs> I got to change what I'm doing here. This isn't right. But anyway, I wanted to uh, Matthew talk to us about balance. Uh, I think we probably need a whole show to talk about balance. Um, it is the, the cry of my heart. It is something that um, I strive for, deeply strive for, because um, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. The abomination is such a strong word. Mm -hmm. You know, Christians like to say, use abomination with stuff like homosexuality, you know. If a man lie with a man, like how we lie with a woman, it's an abomination. And we love to talk about abominations, you know. But a false balance is also an abomination to the Lord. And anybody who's been a Christian from any, for any length of time have met people who are so hairy fairy and so off balanced. So I just... Hairy <laughs> fairy? <laughs> no, I am, so, I am just so... I know people that say, that, that say to me, the Lord told me to wear this red dress with this yellow shoes, with this white sock. And it's every single, it's like they have God on speed dial. And I say, you know, it, God, every little detail. And I'm not saying God don't speak to us. I know he does. But the fact that the God of the universe, I, I, I gave Tony this example once where somebody said that God is maybe something like a GPS. Um... Uh, where the GPS doesn't talk for every corner, but the GPS talks at every major intersection, right? So not with every single, but the you put on this shoe, drive on this road, and that's why I say a balance, because there are times where God would say to you, um, take a lift, and you take a lift and you avoid the accident. But not every single turn that you, you take, the Spirit of God says, get an oatmeal cookie instead of a raisin cookie. It's just like, um, so even this topic today, as we have been discussing, um, us partnering with God, and it's not all God. Um, I just, I put that verse up because somebody on the flip side will say it's all about us and, and, and negate God's influence. And that's why I say, it's so good to have balanced discussions that you can say, yes, we have a part, but primarily God has a huge part to play. He's the one that works. He's the one that's directing us. He's the one that delights in willing and doing through us. And I've said it on this program before, you know, I, I just, I think that Christianity is the most extreme sport on the planet. I think that Red Bull and ESPN don't have any, uh, right on extreme sports because Christians are the most extreme. We swing on either side of the pendulum so hard. So it's all God, predestined, um, immutable grace, you know, and so you can't, like, uh, I don't even want to go there. That's, that's a whole different topic. But it's, it, like to me, and let me say this, and th 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 this is me talking from my heart. The repercussions of eternal damnation the repercussions of a soul spending eternity in damnation, suffering forever. Forever is a really, really, really long time. And the fact that that person was sent to hell because they had no choice, that even if they wanted to accept the Lord, they couldn't because they were not predestined to accept him. I'll just say candidly, if that's the case, I don't want to serve a God like that. I don't want to serve a God who just looks down on earth and says, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, hell. Eeny, meeny, my. And no matter how contrite you are, no matter how much you just can't, it just blows my mind. 
And I refuse to believe that, that, that's the, that that's the loving. God is not willing that any should perish. God so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever believe in him should not perish. That's just cruel, bro. That's just cruel. And um, that's part of the challenge I have with the concept that this omni, everything is just going according to God's plan and God's having uh, a crumpet. I think that's some uh, European snack that uh, Philip has, having a crumpet and a cup of tea with a little pinky watching the world go to hell because, and he has earmarked certain people and they're going to come and who, who he hasn't earmarked, they're going to go to hell. I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that. So that's why I threw up that post we're about a false balance because it's, it's horrible. It's really, it's really horrible in my heart to believe that. I would never tell somebody that. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, we could upset some religious people. Um, but you know what? Um, God's given me a free will to choose him, and isn't that glorious? I'm not a robot. I'm choosing Christ. Amen. And uh, I'm choosing him because he first chose me. That's the principle. Um, that's that's the predestination. Uh, by his foreknowledge, he knew these things, that I would choose him. Um, but somebody still had to preach the gospel to me. That was my old pastor. You know, so I had to respond to that message. So, you know, we could go around in circles. But short story, you, you know, talking about these things, that hearing God's voice and making a difference in your life. Uh, I was traveling down the freeway, the, what we call the motorway here in England, and I was doing 70 miles an hour. And I was in the, the center lane and uh, I heard the voice of God say, change lanes. And I looked in my mirrors and I looked around and I thought, why? Uh, and as I said, why? Um, I, what happened is a truck ahead of me went out over an object, a steel thing or whatever it was. It was moving that fast. It was impossible to see what it was. But this thing was coming towards my windshield, uh, straight towards my face. Uh, at the speed of a bullet, 70 odd mile. I was doing 70, and it must have been doing 70 in the other direction. And uh, suddenly there was this moment where it went sideways. It was like an angel stepped in and struck that object. And it, it went down the side of my vehicle and literally took out the side of my vehicle. Now, if that went through the windshield, I wouldn't be here having this conversation today. But the voice of God spoke to me, but I wasn't quick enough to respond because I questioned God's reasoning. I, I didn't just obey. And I learned a lesson that day. If God says it, I obey straight away. And I, and I better be listening to God. And obviously, I'm still human, so I don't always get it right. But the truth of it is, we, my life w w was on the line. And our lives are on the line when we're uh, in this world. The enemy wants to take us out. The enemy wants to destroy the works that we're called to do when we are called by Christ. And I want to encourage you that if you've got a work to do, get on and do it. And God will protect you if you listen to his voice. You know, we have this mentality, I can go anywhere when we're a young Christian. And we go to the places angels fear uh, to tread, as it were. Uh, but, you know, I believe that if God sends us, sends us he will protect us. But most of the people won't even get up. So then don't become under that protection of being sent. Um, so we have to respond to God's voice to be protected. And sometimes he'll step in and overrule. But 99% of the time it's down to us listening to God and responding. And um, so, yes, um, that was my penny's worth. Just want to add in, just want to add in, and we're close, just wrapping up, but... We haven't even scratched the surface of, of angels. We haven't scratched the, 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 the topic of, 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 of demons. We haven't scratched the surface of the devil. I'm talking about all of them having a role um, in what happens here on this earth with respect to our conversation here. If God gets what he wants all the time, what are angels doing here? Why do angels battle through um, and fight wars to bring the will of God here to earth. You understand what I'm saying? Like, so if God is having his whole will here on earth, we, there, there, there are other components, angels, demons. We haven't even spoke about Satan. 
you know, and the devil and what he can do here. And so it's a great conversation. Um, again, you know, we, we could do an, another program on this because it's just so much, so much data. Let me throw out a thought on the demon thing. You know, if you think about it, if you can take all the scary movies out of your mind for just a minute as it relates to unclean spirits and all that and just focus completely on the, the demonic activity in the New Testament. You know, it seems like demons aren't that interested in haunting houses, you know, in the Bible. They're, they're, they're really not that interested in getting into pigs. I mean, they don't last very long on the pigs. You know, they rush down the hill and drown. But what the demons are really interested in doing is getting into human beings. And I believe the reason they want to get into human beings is because of this dominion factor. Because the human beings have this dominion on the earth to do things. And so if an unclean spirit can infiltrate into the soul of a person, they have the ability to exercise that dominion and create destruction or death or murder or, or perversion or whatever, whatever the agenda is of that demon. So it seems like when a spirit gets cast out of a man, it, it goes through dry places or arid places and does not find satisfaction for itself. So it has to go back. It, it, takes, it takes more demons with it and tries to repossess the person. So anyway, that's another caveat to this whole idea that is, I, I think, very interesting. And it, and it lends a certain kind of support to the idea that the, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are the treasure. There's a treasure in us. It's not us. It's Jesus in us, the hope of glory. And so this idea that we have the potential to express the kingdom of God through our lives, I think is where the, the focus really needs to be. You know, we, we can focus on all these other things in the heavenly realms and this and that, but I really think the focus should be on Jesus on the inside and, and figuring out a way to let Jesus come out, you know, to get Jesus to come out of us. So. I want to, uh, I'm ready to wrap up the program if you guys are. Uh, if anybody has a final word, uh, just jump right in there. Uh, S Steve, you, you've struggled to get your computer back and you're back on the program. You want to say something in conclusion? You want to wrap it up for us? Well, God is in control. <laughs> <laughs> That's, hey, if you guys don't know this, Steve was texting me during the program about his computer crashing. He's like, well, I got the control. I guess he didn't want me on the program. <laughs> we, we, were having a, we were having a little Calvinistic thing going on over here. A little, it, was, it was funny. I, I heard uh, a little bit of what was said, some good stuff um, in uh, – you know, I just, uh, I don't think there's anything I could add that, you know, what you said, Tony, is, is it's all about people. That is the land. We are the holy habitation, the building that he's building. We are his holy habitation. Amen. And uh, that's what the scripture is referring to. It's not, you know, even Jesus, he, he, he showed us a picture of this when he stood there before the temple and he said, you see this, um, I tell you, it'll be destroyed in a three days. I'll raise it up. And it's, he's, he was speaking. He was holy habitation and we are as well. And that's, that's where God's currency is as people. He doesn't have money. Uh, they, they paved the streets in heaven with gold. It means nothing to God. That's the currency of this cursed earth. He's got people. It's people, and and they are they are uh, bond servants by choice. They have made themselves servants. But here's the thing: we say if we uh, when we say servant, he says son. That's how it works. When we put ourselves in a position, we can we can think of it. And I don't want to go open up a whole other uh, avenue, and uh, there will be other shows, but. You know, when the prodigal son came home with the attitude of servant, God lifted him up or the father lifted him up and, and said, my son, he was he was overjoyed. His son had returned. And so when we hug ourselves and we say servant, he says, son, and that's what he's come to do, reestablish his family. Um, and it's people, just as you said so well, uh, it's people that are God's uh God's priority 
and that's his holy habitation. So uh, he wants us to people say, you know, and I understand what they mean when they say uh, they, they quote John the Baptist, where he said, I must decrease and he must increase. But, you know, in a way I was I was kind of praying that prayer to the Lord. And I felt him say, but I want more of you. I'm, I'm like less less of me, Lord, and more of you. He said, but I want more of you. He said, I want I want you out doing. I want to be in you and I want more of you in this earth. I'm trying to get in the earth through you. And so we are his holy habitation. We are his people, his workmanship, created for good works in Christ. So, um, amen. Uh, Matthew, or excuse me, Philip, will you pray? Will you pray us out? Yes, certainly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, we've got to keep that humble heart. We realize that we can't do anything without Christ in us. And uh, right. but at the same time, he's our hope. He's our glory. Well, so we, we do it because we love yeah. him, because he first loved us, you know. And out of prayer should come joy. And um, it should be a joy to pray because we go into fellowship. And I, I, you know, been a Christian a long, long time. And I've been to some prayer meetings where it's not a joy to pray and uh, it's, it's in fact this warfare it's intense but the majority of fellowship with christ is to rest to rest in the finished work to rest in that god is in control and, of our lives if we submit to him um but uh, if we don't submit he isn't in control of uh, of us we're out of control and that's the problem so, Father, we come before you and we give you control. We, we say, Lord, yes. have your way in us and through us and with yes. us, Father, be glorified. Father, we don't want to take your glory. We don't want to uh, take a position that we are not entitled to. But, Father, you have elevated us to sit at your feet, to sit in places of authority that we never asked for uh father we have rule and we have authority over ourselves and lord most of us are failing in this area to begin with so lord inspire us touch us reveal to us through your word what you have done through this covenant in your blood the covenant uh that has made all things new that has re-established relationship with god and so father we want to throw ourselves into the calling you have for us each of us are called and each of us have our yeah. place in your kingdom and so father i'm not striving to be someone i am someone i'm your child i am a Amen. child of the king and so father may that become a reality in my brother's lives in those listeners lives in the sisters that are out there watching uh they're, they're equals in christ and father the, there's so many doctrines that would push them down that would crush their spirits uh, and the, many of them are lies and so father we we're all filled with christ we can all do the things he's called us to do and so father fill us with your spirit in these days revive us and change our thinking to align with your word and this wonderful life you've called us to in jesus name amen and amen amen, amen. well hey in just in conclusion uh you guys that are watching live right now i think there are five or six people on uh on the live uh you guys with me on the program let's share the video let's help people find it and get it out uh thank you so much for everyone's uh, thoughts and mostly for your relationship with God. You know, it, w we speak out of that, the lifetime of experience we've had walking with Jesus. And uh, yeah, Steve, what are you calling out there? The banner, our little bug, our corner yeah. bug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tony B. Hammock Ministries. Yeah, amen. That's, that always bothers Steve. Man. I'll, 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 uh, no, I'll, put, I'll put him over there. <laughs> so it he doesn't, doesn't bother me. <laughs> You're just but, trying to make me behave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'll put it, I'll move it right over your face if you're not careful. No, <laughs> but uh, I can't do that anyway. But uh, thank you for uh, you guys. I appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate your lives and your ministries where you, where you are. And uh, Philip, you're in the UK and uh, Steve's down in Little Rock. I'm, I'm in Batesville, Arkansas. And uh, we're just, uh, we're just delighted to be with you. 
And uh, thanks again for sharing the video. And if there's anything we can do, let us know. Be sure to make comments and ask questions. And uh, you guys, as, as you go through this, uh, check out the comments. There's a lot of comments that have come in. I couldn't post all of them. But uh, anyway, check it out. So thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. God bless.